comparing us to Miles Davis, but there was like a parallel between, you know, we really got into sketches of Spain, say, right? And that was what a Zyrica soft bulletin era. You know, those harmonies and those, you know, chord structures, all that kind of stuff. We were trying to get something from them, for sure. I mean, I, I would dick around for hours and try to get whatever, whatever was happening. And I learned a lot of stuff. So I think some of that's on the soft bulletin for sure. Some of those big uh, chord changes. And then as we went on, it seemed like we got to a point where let's just cut out all the chord changes. We've taken that as far as we can in our way. Kind of mimicked, you know, Miles Davis saying, okay, I've done all the chord changes. Now I just want to make, you know, noise or a groove or a beat or whatever. And just everyone just jams. It kind of felt like we had a, like a kind of a parallel, like by, you know, when we got to embryonic, we did throw out like the idea, of, here's the band playing chord changes and all that, you know. We did, yeah. And it was like, here's a bass line and you, you can do whatever on top of it. So I kind of, I always thought it, kind of thought of it that way, where there was a parallel between, you know, Miles Davis's uh, harmonic progression into uh, modality or whatever, and we kind of did the same thing. Much cheaper version, but you know, kind of the same thing. Uh, when we were actually making embryonic, it seemed like, you know, uh, as much as I, as we all love listening to sketches of Spain, and for me, going back even before that, even like the stuff, the earlier stuff with Gil Evans, you know, the, uh, you know, my ship off whatever record that is, which is traditional, you know, big band stuff in a way, but it's got these just beautiful chord progressions, you know, and you're, you know, the main thrust of the music is these, these great harmonic you know, intricacies and stuff. And then Embryonic was just like, here's just a simple bass line with some stuff sprinkled on top of it. And the drums are just, you know, just a, just a groove. I feel like we kind of were trying to do that and kind of did it, you know. To someone who doesn't, doesn't understand the abstract colorings of all the, you know, the shades that the chords do, I don't think it would, we, it, it would have appealed to us without allowing my stuff to be more simple and even more primitive. I mean, some of the music on Embryonic is so clunky. It's just, you know, it's all over the place. And then those chords with that sound over top of it tells a different story. Then if everybody's clunky and we're just going along. So let's go back to the soft ball thing. So, you know, Wayne's got um, the beginnings of the spark that blew. Three chords, you know, a, a simple, great melody. In the second verse, the whole thing takes off in this whole other realm of chord changes, you know. And in my mind, that was like, Miles Davis with Gil Evans. You're still being Wayne singing these simple lines like Miles Davis would, would play on his trumpet. But the, the undercurrent of it completely shifts. It's a lot more complicated, a lot more nuanced, but your voice is still the same. And I thought that was a great thing that we did with that stuff. So you get to embryonic and you say it's clunky, but it's still, you know, Miles Davis in a way, or you or whatever, your voice, but the, un the undercurrent of it is, is, is different. And it's just more, not simple is not the right word, because there's still some changes, but the rhythm bed's just a constant thing, like almost kind of a drone. But then the chord changes are very subtle little things, whereas the soft bulletin, we'd have these big shifts in mood, but it was always you singing. So that to me was, was the big difference. Yeah. Embryonic at the base of it is primitive, and then the, the top of it is saying something different. To where it's like the soft bulletin, it's almost like the whole thing is almost expressive and beautiful. And then you've got my clunkiness that just can bounce around the top of it. And I think that's where that, that thing, when we like it the best, I don't know if the world likes it the best, but when we like it the best, it sort of feels like you've alighted something that's great about the thing that I'm not aware that I'm doing. And I alight something about what the thing you're doing that you're not aware that you're doing it. And we both get to hear some version of our subconscious to ourselves saying, all right. And that's when we say, well, uh, it's a good thing, you know, yeah. it's a good thing I did that. Or, you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for me, when I think of the, the, the why Miles Davis is like a, just a potent figure, he just feels like a guy who just created himself. You know, he's, it just feels like without, in the realm of all the people out there, and I don't really know, there might be other people that, if you went back in time, you could see he took a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It seemed by the time he was doing the stuff that really spoke to me, which is about the, the, the bitches brew time, yeah. um, he just felt like he was just a man saying, I'm gonna do this the, 
this thing, and even though it breaks completely from what the image and the ideas of what people previously thought of me, I don't give a fuck and I'm just gonna do it. And that part of it, I think, any artist who wants to, who wants to have someone to say, look, you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not crazy for thinking this. I'm not alone. I, w I want to do this thing. I think he's a great... And I don't really know if, if what he did after that really succeeded. I don't know. It, it may have been the thing that, that turned the world off to him. I don't really know. I mean, to me, without him doing that, that complete, like, I'm doing this and I don't care about my old music, without him doing that, it wouldn't be as important to me. Because I think that's what I hope that we can do or are able to do or have have the balls to do once in a while to say I'm just gonna do this and I don't know about the consequences or what people are gonna think and that that's um that's a cool thing and even more cool that he was him with a lot more to lose in a time that was a lot more punishing in a, in a way where it wasn't considered to be such a cool thing whereas now I think you could probably get away with a lot a lot of that and, and still come out all right regardless of what the world thought but it's like man you know so because he's badass you know when we were working on the soft bolts and i think you as much as i did i think you like sketches of spain more than i did I, I was like i was john coltrane giant steps you were miles davis sketches of spain and we were listening to that music a lot and it was like how can we do this crazy you know, it's just it's complicated harmonically. How can we, yeah? How can we, how can we put this in the Flaming Lips realm and make it work? And it's all pulled together with your voice, obviously. But that was that was a big change for us to say instead of guitar chords, we're going to do all this other kind of stuff, you know. So by the time we got to Embryonic, it, in some weird way, it made sense to me that we were doing that, where we're saying throw out the chord changes, throw out the whatever, the pop production, and we're just going to play some weird groove shit and put some stuff on top of it. That's kind of how I looked at it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's why it, we see ourselves in that because it's like, we don't know, you know, the reasons that he did it or, or what it was like in his group, but we see within ourselves, when we stumble upon that, it's still a mystery to us. And we're like, you know, there's what we think we're gonna do and then there's what really happens. And um, I think that's the great, um, even the way that we make our records now, where we are, we're playing stuff, but we're using bits of it. The much the way that they would, um, what's his producer, what's his name? Tio, Tio, you know, he would, he'd take a, a section of their, their jam. Fiddleback, sorry. <laughs> but you know, he would, he'd take a section and he would turn, he would make that the song as opposed to, you know, the, all the, the moments before and the moments after, yeah. and sort of capture this this one special, you know, moment that they got into. And I think we do that a lot. I think that's the, even the thing that, um, you know, some of the Beastie Boy stuff, where it's like you, you know, they're jamming, but there's even you know the way that we jam sometimes is like it goes, and then because we're pushing it and pulling it, it gets sometimes weirder, sometimes not weirder, sometimes boring, but then almost inevitably there's some moment you're like, man, that's really, that's really cool. And then it kind of blows up on you and you move on. But if you're able to record all these things and you know, you, you're, having, you're having these special moments all captured. Um, and I think that, I think knowing that they did that and that's part of the recordings that so much influenced us, I think it allowed us to think that we could do that same thing, that we could, we could grab little moments and even and not worry that it's us playing or it's us not playing. It's just a moment of sound that somehow we would claim that we created, even though it really just created itself, but we would claim we created it and we'd, we'd make that our, our song. I think that's, a, that's as, you know, that's as valid and that's as modern and that's as new and that's as old and that's as timeless as anything. I think the first thing I ever cared about actually it was actually probably Sketches of Spain. I just, maybe it was my age or something, or uh, late 20s, you know. I never, I never liked jazz. I mean, I, I did like jazz in high school because I wanted to try to figure out the chord progressions, you know, but it was just a purely like, uh, <laughs> just a musician trying to learn chords, you know. But the first time it actually moved me in any way, it was probably like, you know, 
my late 20s, but, um, and st I still had to dig around for a while and, and to get stuff, and I, I did love John Coltrane pretty, pretty quickly, but it didn't really hit me until I was like 28 or 29, and um, all of a sudden it, it just hit me in some way, so I don't know. But, I mean, with Miles Davis, okay, look, you know, he obviously a great trumpet player, but, I mean, he was just such a badass, even by, you know, uh, when he did Kind of Blue, that was kind of a landmark record to say, there's a lot of songs on that record where they said, let's throw out the chord changes, and let's just say, you're going you're gonna to riff in D, and we all take solos in D, and that, that was kind of a big deal back then. A lot of people thought it was like heresy or something, you just couldn't do that, you know. And then uh, the song Blue and Green, which is like one of my favorite songs of all time. Again, that's one, instead of saying we're doing chord progressions that land, that end up going back to the, the root chord, it was just a meandering chord progression that just kept changing and never seemed to have like a, a tonal basis, you know? And uh, the Flaming Lips haven't done that yet, but I, I hope we will one of these days, you know? Or some incarnation of us will do it, but... Okay, now I'm, now I'm rambling.